And I just want to welcome you to uh, our session this morning. We're all in this together about developing a home school partnership for student success. And like I said, I'm Lena Bender, coordinator at the Orange County Department of Education. I'm helping facilitate our Zoom morning, uh, meeting this morning. And I do want to welcome and introduce you to our wonderful presenter this morning, Danny Carrillo. He's coming to us with a great background as a teacher in, from the classroom, as someone who has used and lives restorative practices and um, has been greatly involved in bully prevention work and is passionate about home and family supports for youth. So I want to welcome him this morning and give him a special thanks for um, all that he's done to put this on this morning. I also want to let you know that our recording of today's session, along with a sheet that looks like the one you see on your screen, um, with a bunch of resources and links to resources, will be posted on the California PBIS website. So I'm going to post a link to that right now. And that should go up either later today or first thing Monday once it gets posted on their website. So you'll be able to find all of that there. Now, a couple things just to help our morning run a little smoothly. Of course, we have to have some PBIS positive um, expectations. So we ask to be respectful this morning, to be present in our time together and minimize other distractions around you as much as possible. Um, please be responsible by participating in our chats and our breakout rooms and do share your thoughts openly. And then for safety, uh, please mute your devices and turn off your cameras if you would rather not be recorded. So this might look familiar to a few folks. It's um, a mood meter coming to us from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And it's a wonderful way to kind of do a check-in with ourselves and each other. And you'll see that there's sort of these two axes on this mood meter um, related to pleasantness, and that goes on a range from low to high, and then energy from low to high. And it kind of helps us categorize different moods that we can find ourselves in um, related to how pleasant and how much energy we have. So I'm gonna pause here just for a second and I'll ask that we all do a quick check-in and we can just type in what is our mood in this moment this morning. So I'll give you a moment just to identify where you're feeling and go ahead and post it in our chat. All right, people are feeling calm, focused, joyful, at ease, wonderful. And I'm seeing that folks are coming to us from Westminster, um, Central California. Oh, Valencia High School, wonderful. You guys did a great mental health video I've been hearing about. Shout out to you guys, Magnolia School District, um, no Northern California, wonderful. Um, I think I saw someone from Kentucky. So um, awesome, so glad you guys are here with us this morning. We're feeling pleased, chill, mellow, optimistic energized, tired, a lot of us are feeling tired, um, relaxed, grateful, upbeat. Hey Stockton, good morning, welcome, you're glad you're here, mellow, tired, uneasy, yeah, and calm, wonderful. So thank you for doing that quick check-in, it's good to kind of notice how we're feeling and, and take a moment and breathe. Well, good morning, everyone. Grateful to be sharing this hour with you guys. Um, again, my name is Danny Carrillo. My hope is that you leave this presentation feeling empowered and equipped to tackle some of the issues that, that lay ahead. And so with that being said, let me just quickly go through the agenda and what it's going to look like today. I'm going to uh, go over three ways to empower remote teaching. We're going to have some breakout sessions. Uh, I think it's vital and critical that we reflect on the information that we're gonna be sharing today um, with other educators so that you can share ideas and solutions to problems that maybe I'm not hitting on or maybe I'm not necessarily speaking on. And so we wanna bring in the collective wisdom of all of us in this room. And in addition to that, uh, having some group reflection when we come back from our breakout sessions, as well as uh, being able to provide you some resources. And so the outcomes of what we're trying to establish here is uh, really understanding that strong communication with families and students to address needs, being able to create a safe and positive uh, virtual community to support students' social emotional well-being, and then last is creating meaningful and relevant curriculum that really motivates students to learn given the context in which we're in. And so 
put it into context in two months it's only been two months and it feels like it's been an eternity in two months uh schools have been closed we've been sheltered in place uh six million students here in the country all learning from home teachers are instructing online and parents are left to figure it all out it's a lot okay and it's been a roller coaster of adapting to this new normal uh, and so what i did was i prepared by looking into recent reports, briefs uh, from state and national research uh, centers. I reached out to educators, fellow colleagues, and parents to just kind of get input and, and feedback in terms of how they're experiencing uh, everything that's going on and really pinpoint three focal points that I'm gonna be addressing today. Um, but when we talk about it and when we look at it, we're really looking at the challenges that we're facing. And so when we talk about PBIS, the quality of life, the extent to which physical, mental, social, and emotional functioning is consistent with personal preferences, we've all been disrupted, okay? Educators, parents, students, it has impacted all of us, some disproportionately more so, but nonetheless, we've all been impacted. And so for us teachers, we're trying to, figure, educators are trying to figure out how do we continue uh, to, to have these instructions in place of high quality, keep connection to our students and our families. Parents are trying to figure it out and juggle between work and managing care at home. Students are obviously anxious from all the changes that have occurred. And so we're all trying to figure out ways to create stability. And so really addressing that from all these perspectives is what I'm gonna attempt to do today. Um, and so as we move forward, I like this image because it really illustrates the feeling that a lot of us may have. Uh, and I love this quote, uh, we are not working and learning at home. We are at home during a global crisis trying to work and learn. And so that slight difference is meaningful because we didn't have time to prepare. We didn't have time to train. We, we are making the tracks as we're going along. We are putting it together as we're moving along. And so I want to give credit to all you educators out there and to all people working with families and, and, and providing youth services. And that is the, the amount of courage that it takes to take on <laughs> such a, a momentous kind of challenge, uh, recreating the arena of, of, of the field of education and having the resiliency to move forward. And so as we move through this, we are gonna try to tackle a lot, but I encourage and I invite each and every one of you to please share your wisdom I do not come as providing all answers. I'm providing suggestions and ideas, but I wanna hear feedback and I hope that you guys collaborate. We need to be developing those networks with people, even outside our local circles, to make sure that we're finding answers to the problems that we have. So as we move forward, um, this is how I'm summarizing. Three ways to empower your remote teaching. Let's talk, let's connect, let's learn. So let's talk, we're gonna really hone down the pathways of communication, really establishing, I need to get a hold of students and parents, what's the best way? Second is, let's connect. Once I do get a hold of them, how do we develop a, a strong relationship with our families and students, given the, the distance that we are now uh, having to experience so that we maintain their social emotional well being? And then, last but not least, how do we engage students in a meaningful way so that we continue the learning and prepare them for success? Uh, in the near future. So starting with, let's talk. The essential question here is how do we establish a strong two-way communication between families and schools to address needs? That is the question that we're dealing with right here, okay? So establishing communication is the first step to that stability. And so as we move forward, um, we are gonna be looking at first operational. So the operational aspect of this, and I hear this from, from, from educators, is allowing time for educators, if this is our priority, to just get a hold of students and families, we need to schedule time for teachers and educators to call. It's not as easy as it may seem. And so we need to allow educators to have their time on their work schedule to input time for them to call uh, out to families and, and students. We also need to be able to track who are we getting a hold of, who have we not been able to get a hold of, and what uh, for those that we do get a hold of, and what method do they prefer to get a hold, be uh, uh, 
excuse me, contacted, um, and being able to track all that information. Uh, in addition to that, centralizing your forms of communication. Less is more here, and especially for families. Uh, on their receiving end, they're being contacted from multiple teachers, uh, from, from the principal, admin, district, a lot of messages are coming in. And so trying to centralize that is going to be uh, helpful in making sure that information gets over. And then last but not least, using all available contact information, emergency cards. Uh, grandma is a good motivator when you contact that motor, motor, um, emergency card. Um, third party, which I would say use your district uh, uh, guidance on what is allowed, but third party, other families trying to get a hold and sending messages through, through students, uh, local churches. Um, I know that I've heard from districts that have uh, tied their communication to food drop-offs and, and deliveries uh, so that uh, families are still getting that information. Uh, so really looking at that operational aspect. In terms of effective messaging, and this is what the research shows, is really, really finding out what is the preferred method from families to receive that communication. Do they want it in the text or in the app? Do they want a phone call? Do they want it uh, through video instruction? Do they want it in the mail? Do they want some uh, hard, tangible uh, information? So really finding out from them what is the preferred method. Also, it needs to be easy and clear. Few clicks, few steps. The long-winded you are or the long uh, wording of the message is going to get lost in translation. In addition to that is having how-to guides uh, and video tutorials so that families know how to access the information that we are asking them uh, uh, to, uh, and trying to get, them, uh, get to them. And then last for effective messaging is translation. Uh, relying on our district and our school for translation uh, for families uh, that need it. Um, and then if those are not available to you, um, obviously colleagues, if, if they speak the, the home language or fellow students to see if they could be an assistance. And then last but not least, apps. Uh, one particular app that I know is very popular is Talking Points. This is an app that has, I think, up to 100 different languages in which you can send a message to the family and it'll translate for you. Families can uh, relay uh, a message back and they'll translate it back to, to your native language. Uh, and so it helps with that communication. So I would say look into it, see if that uh, helps you um, in terms of translation. And then last but not least, uh, a professor from uh, UC Santa Barbara, Victor Ruiz, uh, came up with this concept of affectionate mass communication. It's, it's this idea of public tenderness, the idea that we need to continue to encourage and support our communities, and we need to do it in a variety of ways. Not only just check-ins for basic needs and providing uh, food, uh, financial support, or some kind of form of information for emergency services, but also just letting them know that we are here for you. We want to know how you're doing, how you're feeling, what are needs that you have, and what can we do to help. All that messaging is going to be helpful. And so we can move forward on the slide here. It, what, it, what we've seen on news reports is, you know, teachers sending videos, uh, obviously the food deliveries, um, postcards, digital messages. We need to flood this communities and our families with support and affection and encouragement. They are obviously dealing with a lot as we all are. And also the news is bombarding them with, you know, constant imagery and, and stories of sort of the fate of the next few months. And so we need to continue to let them know we are here, we're in this together, and we can support each other. And so what are the lessons learned from Pathways of Communication? Trial and error is our best teacher. We just got to try something, see what works, and, 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 and what we find works, we keep moving. Making data-driven decisions is going to be helpful to have a clear picture as to how we're addressing these needs. And then again, messages need to be centralized, easy to follow, and accessible to all. And then just be persistent and creative. Families that we finally get a hold of are very appreciative and grateful for finally contacting them um, and, and providing them the information that they desperately need. Uh, and so just being persistent and creative. So as we move into our breakout sessions, keeping in mind sort of the forms in which we're trying to contact our families, I'm gonna do this sort of method of plus minus equal. 
So as you go into your breakout sessions, we're going to give you guys about 15 minutes to talk with your, or your colleagues and participants in your breakout room. Follow the sequence of first, what are the forms of communication that are working for you? How have you overcome that uh, communication barrier? The minus or the struggle is what challenge to communication still remains for you? And then last, share some tips and ideas with each other. Try to solve each other's problems by giving each other ideas or possible solutions that maybe you've already overcome. And so I'll turn it to, to Lena so that we can go out to our breakout sessions. All right, thank you, Danny. So in just a moment, you're gonna see a little bubble pop up on your screen to join a breakout room. So we invite you to click that button. And once you get to that breakout room, feel free to turn on your microphone and your video. Um, you will not be recorded in the rooms. And, um, and we'll be posting the questions if you uh, need to remember what they are. So enjoy your breakout time. Wonderful, looks like people are joining their rooms. If you're having trouble joining, feel free to put something in the chat box and we're happy to assist. Well, I hope everyone had fruitful um, breakout sessions and discussions. Um, I, I do want to reflect just briefly uh, on the issue of communication and ask that you either share a challenge that remains for you or a, an idea that you would like to share with the larger group. Um, and if you uh, would like to share, if you could share that in the chat box, um, just so that we can start generating some ideas, some thoughts in regards to the communication uh, challenge that many of us might be facing. So again, just to take a minute, uh, some of the thoughts that maybe you were discussing in your breakout sessions, please type in the chat box, share with the colleagues, share with all of us some challenges or possible solutions that uh, you have been able to execute. Thank you, folks are sharing out. Um, I'm seeing a comment from Joseph about the digital divide. Yeah. and the differences between families losing or not having ISP. Um, I'm seeing, you know, friends. Consistency with kids, connecting via different online platforms and check-ins up and down with them. Uh, and, uh, phone calls to parents and students who are not concerned, giving words of encouragement, unstable internet services, definitely. Oh, we have one uh, colleague here that uh, is running small groups using Google Hangouts and doing that nice. weekly. Nice. So that's one way to offer some additional supports and in a small group. Google Voice is definitely, for those who are not using it, that's a great way to keep your privacy but still have a form and a, and a way to communicate with families, definitely. Wow, I want to highlight Terry. Terry shared that they're hosting parent webinars each week. Awesome. Wow, Terry. Ooh, WebEx video groups. Mm -hmm. So many great ideas, you guys. Some challenges of parents maybe not returning emails or canceling the invitations that you send for apps like Dojo. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And so a lot of this is going to just, again, trial and error, persistence, and being creative. But it sounds like you guys, definitely some challenges are still ahead of us. But... You guys are coming up with great ideas. Um, and so I, I love the discussions that you guys were having and I love that you guys are sharing. So thank you for that. Again, using our collective wisdom to solve problems um, is, gonna be, is gonna be useful and helpful as we move forward. So definitely thank you. So as we move into uh, the next section, we do wanna actually take a poll from everybody. Um, we should have done this in the beginning, but we, we kind of just ran through it a little bit. We're gonna take a quick poll. We wanna know who's in the room, the, where, where are you coming from uh, in regards to your professional background so that we can gauge uh, sort of the collective wisdom and, and hear different perspectives. And so Alina's gonna send that poll out to everybody. Please uh, just give us a sense of what is your professional background.
All right, I'm gonna give a few more seconds if you wanna join in on that poll before it's closed. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll now. We've got just over 80% of you have voted, so you've shared. And I'm gonna share with you our results. And it looks like we kind of have a, a mix of folks in the room. Um, about a quarter of us are teachers in the room. We have about 10, 11% that are site administrators leading your sites through this new digital learning age. Um, we have quite a few folks that are pupil personnel services, so perhaps a counselor, psychologist, some sort of mental health provider, um, student supports in that way. A few community service providers, thanks for joining us, awesome. Mm -hmm. And then quite a few folks that are kind of in other roles, so maybe I'm wondering district folks or other sort of support roles um, for schools. Awesome, awesome. And again, I, I invite everybody, uh, especially there's a lot of issues that we're facing that overlap in terms of the roles that we play, but there are things that are unique in, in particular to the roles that we play. And so hearing this difference of opinion in terms of our approach and possible solutions is going to be important. Hearing from different community members, community agencies, teacher perspective, admin perspective is going to be important as we move forward. So. Um, we're going to move into the second part, which is let's connect. So we finally got a hold of students. We finally got a hold of parents, uh, whether consistent or not, but we got a hold of them. So really now focusing on the social emotional well-being. And so the essential question is how to create a safe and supportive environment where students feel seen, heard, and valued. And so that is going to be our focus for this next slide. And so it goes without saying that kids are experiencing an array of emotions due to uh, school closures, the coronavirus, it's a disruption of their routines, uh, the friendships and how they interact with them, and simply movement, that they can't go anywhere. And so you're seeing a rise in anxiety, kids are tired, frustrated, stressed. I mean, all those emotions that we're all feeling, uh, but in the sense of kids not necessarily having control to have answers to those feelings. And so, uh, knowing that that's a lot that's uh, sitting on our, on our students' shoulders. Now, not all students are responding the same. Some students have great support systems. They have resources available to them. And so they're not necessarily uh, being impacted. But, but a variety of students and a good number of uh, families are been, being disproportionately impacted. And so as we look at our role in connecting with families and students, we should be concerned about their emotional lives. And so given that, what are steps that we can take to create virtual classrooms where students feel supported, valued, seen, where they can express, where they can laugh, and they can be silly, all that stuff. So it begins with self-care. We need to have self-care, which is really self-love, okay? And I would refer you to uh, some additional webinars that are on the CPC website that directly talk about self-care, but we need to take care of ourselves uh, to make sure that we have the emotional health to be able to lend that help to our families and students. So self-care is a vital component before we move in to supporting others. The second piece is classroom culture, which is centered on trust, okay? In class, when we, even in our physical class, when we were back at school, kids need to feel safe in that classroom. They need to feel safe in that space. And that's centered on trust. And if students don't feel that they can trust the teacher, they, they don't feel they can trust their fellow classmates, then that puts a sense of fear that they can't express themselves, that they can't share, that they're not gonna go out of the way to take risk. So it limits their academic performance and their involvement and participation. But when we can create a culture in which they can trust that they're gonna be respected and valued, then it opens up the possibility for them to take risks, to engage, to be motivated. And so establishing community agreements is gonna be vital. Setting up those agreements, those expectations, and those routines in your virtual classrooms is, is, is paramount. How do we expect to come together? How do we bring our best self? And having student input, having them carry that discussion. What do we expect from each other when we're finally meeting each other uh, through video conferencing? How do we expect to talk and engage each other? What are things that we want to do when we come together? 
how do we hold each other accountable? Students holding adults accountable too. And how can we be forgiving and flexible with one another, knowing that there's other things that we're not in control of? So having those expectations explicitly talked about is important. Having community building sessions where students can, can check in with you and where you can take temperature checks of the class, uh, getting to know you activities where kids can share and express and get to know each other, um, as well as consistent check-ins with individual students, making sure that we're contacting them, letting them know we're here for them, ready to provide them a support when they need it. Uh, I'm gonna be putting together a, a particular webinar session on the CPC website that directly is involved with that connection uh, aspect, but um, please check in for that when, when that information comes out to you. But classroom culture is important. And then opportunities to socialize. No assignments, no lectures, let's just socialize. So one idea that, that I'm kind of collecting information was lunch meetings. The same way kids would walk into your classroom during lunch because they just want to get away, they just want to sit, they just want to talk. Having that virtual classroom as well, where a time where you can schedule for people to just kind of sit and talk and have lunch together. Celebrating special events, birthdays, small accomplishments, big moments in families' lives, celebrating those things together. Uh, spirit days, dressing up, funny ways to come together, dance parties I've heard, book and movie reviews where kids and families can come together to share you know, a particular docu uh, documentary. Now, this is part of how you can kind of start guiding that, those, those uh, uh, interests in really developing uh, sort of academic skills. And then last but not least, fun challenges. Challenge that it requires social interaction, so they interview family members or they, they try to research something and they collaborate with other students. So opportunities to socialize. And then last but not least, parent support. Parents want the best for their kids and they're overwhelmed. What I keep hearing from parents is, I need to know what role do I play? I don't wanna be the teacher, but obviously we're stuck in the situation, so I need to have my kid learn. So what are those trainings, tips, or strategies that I could be the co-teacher? Give me a simple video, give me three tips. What can I do to help my kid get through their homework, get through their lesson? Also providing resources for PBS at home. And that will be connected uh, in the resource uh, links that we give you guys uh, to help parents create that uh, environment in the home setting. And then last but not least, coffee with the teacher. Opportunities to have that space for just adults where the teacher and the, and, the, and the parents can interact, they can bond, we can share challenges, and then provide opportunity for support where, they, where it's needed. All those things coming together to create an environment in which the social emotional well-being is top priority. And so what are the lessons learned from this? First and foremost, it's okay to be human. You make mistakes, you're trying to make it work, it doesn't always go the way you want it to go. It's okay to express your frustration, your ups and downs. It's okay to be human, okay? Second is have resources available because once you open that door for check-ins, temperature checks, seeing how kids are doing, once they really can trust you in the process, they'll start opening up and they're gonna you know, ask for help. And so working with your school and your district to have those resources available so when that moment comes, you are ready to tackle that issue right away or at least give them the resource to know where to go. And then be proud of how far you've come. In two months, we have redesigned and reconstructed the arena of education. I am proud of all these educators, all of you, in doing everything you can uh, to make sure that we move it forward. And then last but not least, celebrate all successes, no matter how small. Celebrate those successes. Let's keep a positive and hopeful spirit uh, within our class. So as we move into the breakout session, we're again focusing on the plus, the minus, and the equal. How have you integrated social emotional interactions and development with students? What has been challenging in supporting students with their social emotional well-being? And then tips and ideas that we can share with each other to solve problems. Again, we're gonna break out, we'll come back, and we'll finish with the last slide. All right, so the invitation has gone out to breakout rooms. Please join your groups. You'll be going back to your same groups that you were talking to just a few moments ago. Thank you. 
All right, and it looks like everybody's back in our main room. Perfect. Again, I hope you're having rich discussions in your breakout sessions. And so keeping with the same format, plus, minus, equal, uh, spending just a minute, because we definitely want to finish off the last slide and give enough time for another breakout session, is uh, in the chat box quickly, what is working, what is still challenging, what are ideas that we can share. We are collecting all of this. We definitely want to continue to provide support. The more ideas that we can share with each other, the better, the more challenges that you can put forward, and we will do our best to answer them. And so please take in a minute to uh, put something in the chat box to share with each other briefly uh, before we move to the next slide. Thanks, Olivia. I see that um, you're trying to do birthday postcards and assemblies with students with the admin joining to kind of keep those regular school traditions alive. Uh, looks like Lexi, your pupil personnel services have a Google form to try to um, connect teachers and students with and staff to counselors. Awesome. Self-care and mindfulness app using Headspace, that app. It's wonderful. Free access for educators right now. Um, a birthday collage, Tanya says. And shout outs. Calling families to check in and not necessarily talk about homework. So just making that social emotional connection. Doing a little Google Meet the first few minutes of homeroom. Um, admins participating, jumping in on Zoom or Google Meets with different classes. Well, and Cindy, th thank you for starting that, that question. It's going to be a great segue. Do you start with social emotional and then move to your curriculum? The research would say yes. In this particular moment, you can make the argument even before coronavirus, yes. Uh, the old saying is kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I know I definitely was that student. You can be brilliant, bright, don't matter. But if I don't like you, I'm not going to listen to you. And so... Uh, that's a very unique experience for me, but nonetheless, for students, they're overwhelmed with a lot of changes and definitely attending to the social emotional. So as we move into the last slide, uh, how do we get students to feel engaged and motivated to learn given this large context? How do we keep students engaged in the curriculum and motivated to learn? Well, there are a couple strategies and, and, and tips that, that I definitely will share. First and foremost, and this is sort of a touchy subject, Clarifying what is required and what is supplemental. I've heard from many parents that they feel overwhelmed by the 20 assignments, 10 assignments, you know, depending on the grade level, to know like, well, I thought they're not grading. I thought, you know, but they keep sending a bunch of homework. And so am I supposed to do it? Is my kid going to be behind? Like, so really clarifying what's required and what's supplemental. As much as educators, we want learning to happen in all aspects. Being clear is going to help parents make those right choices and know how much they're going to put pressure on their kid to finish something and not overwhelm them knowing that some of that is not necessarily going to be, they're not going to be held accountable for. Uh, the second thing is humanizing the curriculum. So really keeping it student-centered, student-led, getting their input so that they find meaning and relevancy into the lessons and activities that they're doing designing lessons that are stimulating and interesting uh, to the students. So again, so that requires their input as to what they were interested in. Reflection is crucial, helping them to reflect on their own taking, mastery, efforts, and really looking at the things that they're doing to develop those skills. Encouraging dialogue and collaboration is going to be important, providing a variety of formats and then multiple opportunities for them to express, to talk, to share with each other, with you, with the class, uh, to really create that storytelling. And then last but not least, effective feedback. Really looking at the mastery of skills, shifting from a grade-oriented system to a feedback-oriented system. And really information, that feedback is really just providing students with an understanding of their efforts to reach a goal. And the only way students can can get better at something is that they're receiving that effective feedback. So what is effective feedback? It is not a simple comment. It's not a generic praise. Good job, needs work. That is not effective feedback. Effective feedback has purpose. There's a goal in, in set in place, so it's goal-oriented. 
it's actionable. You are telling them exactly how, what steps they need to take to reach that goal, to master that skill. And then last but not least, you're providing consistent support and feedback to reflect on their efforts as they move forward. And so the more students gain control and empowered by their learning, they're gonna be more motivated and increase their academic performance. And so what are the lessons learned? Reflection is crucial. It should be integrated in every lesson in some facet. Second is keep it simple and flexible. Acknowledge the home life, knowing that they're not always gonna be able to meet the deadline or, or, or kind of execute it the way we would like it. Be flexible. Uh, third is make it a personalized experience. So again, getting their feedback, passion projects. And then last but not least, uh, like always as educators, we will figure it out in due time. And so we're gonna make it work. And so as we move to our last breakout session, um, this one's gonna be a little bit shorter, but just again, just a moment for you guys to share in terms of engaging students, strategies, what's working, what's not, and ideas to share with each other. These last uh, few minutes, uh, I want to thank everybody. Again, rich discussions that you're having uh, in your breakout sessions. If you still want to uh, post some comments on the chat box, please, by all means, uh, give us feedback in terms of ideas that you want us to address, maybe things we weren't necessarily talking about today but that maybe we can sign a webinar. Um, the more that we can assist each other, challenge each other, the better that we're going to get in preparation for the fall. We know that there's a mountain of issues that are, are arising and waiting for us. So let's plant those seeds now. Let's work on solutions now. And the best way we can do that is getting feedback from you in terms of ways that we can support you in the best way we can. A video we weren't able to show today, but please, when you get a chance, go back and watch this video. Very, very meaningful and really just kind of encouraging and the resiliency that we all have and that you as teachers have in getting things done. So I want to thank you again for attending. I appreciate you spending this hour with us. When you get a chance, if you can um, click on this uh, link here to give us your thoughts about today's webinar and completing this evaluation, that would be deeply appreciated. And then Lena, I'll let you close out with the last slide. Right. I know there's some questions. Yes, everything from today will get posted on the CPC website. Um, we'll leave this link up here if you wanna give us a little feedback that helps the CPC know what other topics you would like some information on, how else can we be supported. Um, so appreciative that everyone took time this morning to be here. And we'll stick around for a few minutes if you wanna continue the chat or talking. Otherwise, have a wonderful day. Thank you all very much. It's good, a good webinar. Thank, Thank you, you. For that. Thank you. And have a wonderful weekend as well. Thanks, you too. Thank you so much, Danny. That was Oh uh, No, thank so you. Helpful. Lena, you, you know how to host, you know how to run this whole thing. The least I can do for you to yeah. share good stuff with us. Thank you. I'm so glad we saw so many familiar names and some folks that are coming from, you know, further away. It's so nice to just connect. I'm looking through our chat, you know, folks coming from Northern California. We had someone calling into Kentucky. Sounds like someone was trying to, to talk. What does what does C C P C